Hello, hello, attendees of the webinar. Welcome in. Just wanted to open up the room a few minutes early to let people in before we get started at noon. So go ahead and sit tight for a few minutes and then we'll go ahead and jump into today's webinar. Thanks to everyone that's joining us early today. We're just gonna give everyone a few more minutes before we get started. Thanks for being online. All right, welcome, welcome everyone to ACES's, uh, the American Solar Energy Society's November webinar on solar water purification. I'm Carly Sapola. I'm the Director of Operations um, for ACES, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, the American Solar Energy Society is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was established in 1954 and advocates for sustainable living in 100% renewable energy by sharing information, events, and resources to cultivate, to cultivate community and power progress. So welcome again to this month's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to give a little update on some of our ACES programs that are happening right now. We are planning for our 50th annual National Solar Conference, Solar 2021, Empowering a Sustainable Future. This will be taking place in Boulder, Colorado, at the University of Colorado, Boulder, from August 3rd to the 6th, uh, next summer, 2021. Uh, and we are planning to pivot to virtual in case anything with COVID um, is still in the works at that time. Um, so still planning to be in Boulder, but uh, might be virtual if need be at that time. Um, we'll be planning to make a decision sometime um, early in 2021. So we'll keep everyone updated on that. Um, but the big news for the conference is that the call for participation is now open. Uh, so please head to aces.org slash participate 2021 to learn more and submit by January 15th. And uh, one of our other programs, the National Solar Tour, we just had our 25th annual National Solar Tour partnered with Solar United Neighbors. It was all virtual and it was a great success. You can still head to nationalsolartour.org to watch all of the content from this year's tour and be sure to uh, save the date for next year's tour which will be October 2nd and 3rd 2021. And the latest Solar Today magazine has been released. You can read it now online by signing in at aces.org as an ACES member and heading to the Solar Today archives tab to read it. ACES is also currently running a membership drive, and we're asking you to join, renew, or gift an ACES membership today to help us double our membership by August 2021. 
Uh, you can learn more about all of our membership options at aces.org slash join. And if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to email membership at aces.org at any time. You can also learn more about our upcoming ACES and partner events at aces.org slash ACES events. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, um, who is also our board chair, uh, Robert Foster. I'll give a short introduction about Robert. Robert is a solar engineer with 36 years of experience implementing thousands of solar projects in 42 countries, including mini grids, chillers, water pumps, and water purifiers. Robert began his career in 1984 with the Cole Solar Systems in Austin, Texas, where he fabricated and installed solar hot water systems. He also served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic, where he helped pioneer the solar home system concept, collaborating with Enersol Associates. He joined New Mexico State University in 1989 and was the internal programs manager uh, for the Southwest Region Solar Experiment Station for a quarter of a century. He retired from New Mexico State University in 2014, but remains a professor on solar and wind for the College of Engineering. Since 2014, he's worked for Windrock International off and on implementing solar programs in Africa and Asia, and is currently um, supporting a project for Windrock International in Nigeria. Robert was a founding partner of Solaqua in 1999 as the CTO and obtained eight patents and has served as president since 2004. Robert is a former chairman of the Texas Solar Energy Society, as well as past president of the El Paso Solar Energy Association, where he managed solar water distillation projects in dozens of communities on both sides of the US and Mexico border for the state of Texas, uh, the EPA and C-O-N-A-H-E-C. Long one. <laughs> Robert is presently uh, the Shaladia team leader implementing the Asian Development Bank's solar photovoltaic pumping for agricultural irrigation project with the Bangladesh Rural Electrification Board. And now presently serves as the ACES chairman and is the presenter for our November webinar today on solar water purification. So with that, I will go ahead and turn things over to Robert. Take it away. Oh, it looks like you might be muted. There we go. Thank, thank you. I was trying to <laughs> unmute there, but. Uh. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you, Carly. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, 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 attending. Uh, bienvenidos a la frontera solar. Welcome to the solar border. Uh, fortunately, for many of you, I probably I won't do give it in Spanish, but uh, I'm glad uh, you're here. So, what we're going to talk about today is uh, 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 solar water purification. I'm going to give an overview of technologies. Uh, can, can you see my screen, Carly? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, like Carly mentioned, I've, I'm retired from New Mexico State University. I uh, occasionally teach classes, mostly solar and wind. Uh, and so, so this is a you know a lecture I would often give to my students. Uh, oops, let's see. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how to go forward. There we go. Okay. Well, she talked about ACES. Uh, so I, I just encourage you to support ACES and its programs, uh, and, and you know, uh, and give a donation today. Uh, to help us with programs like this in the future. So, okay, so I'd like to just start to go over water issues. I became motivated to get into uh, water purification back in my Peace Corps days uh, because, you know, I 
saw firsthand, you know, how it affected people. Several babies in my community died from bad water. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was working on aqueducts and this kind of thing. So, so, you know, there's roughly a billion people globally who do not have access to clean water and about 5 million a year die from waterborne illnesses. So uh, coronavirus is bad, but bad water is worse. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, what can we do to address these issues? Um, so the, the shot on the left is, that's in Ciudad Juarez, just across the river from me. Uh, agua potable, potable water. Uh, but anytime you get water in a, you know, tanker truck, it's suspect. So, but in a lot of the border colonias, that's how people get their water. So, so looking at just kind of an overview of the main technologies, and, and then we're going to drill into a solar distillation. Uh, first on the list is aeration. Aeration is very simple. This is basically just like your fish tank. Uh, so it, uh, you know, it's important for like your fish tank to keep the fish alive so that the, there's enough oxygen in the water. It can, it's simple, it can remove, uh, you know, some metals, uh, oxidizing metals, but it's, it's not going to disinfect the water kill microbes, that kind of thing. So, uh, uh, you know, next on the list is boiling, pasteurization. Uh, this is a good way to kill organisms. Uh, you know, you have to boil the water or come close to boiling for a certain amount of time, you know, so many seconds, and that will kill microorganisms. It it's, uh, doesn't eliminate any salts and minerals, and it uh, does not provide residual disinfection, which means, uh, you know, the water can become recontaminated fairly easily. There's nothing in there to kill new microbes uh, or organisms that may get into the water. Uh, just a kind of a side note, you know, having run into this several times in different places, uh, you know, boiling water is also not good for batteries because the salts and minerals are still there. So I've, I've had, you know, rural farmers and things, you know, that's the solar system, they boil the water for the batteries, thinking it's clean, but it's, it's not, you know, true. And the, the salt and minerals can, destroy your battery plates. So. Okay, filters. Uh, this is pretty effective uh, to remove organic contaminants, uh, uh, minerals, you know, it's actually qu quite an old technique, you know. If, if you go like uh, Central America, the Mayan, you know, they used filters 2,000 years ago with zeolites and uh, other, you know, carbon to filter out their water and clean their water. So, so this has been known for some time. You, you know, commonly get under the sink filters. Uh, so it's good at removing certain types of solids. Uh, it doesn't provide any disinfection. Uh, you know, certain filters like carbon filters are very good at removing uh, or volatile organic compounds like gasoline, benzene, pesticides. Uh, so if you have those kind of contaminants, you want to use, uh, say, an activated carbon filter. Uh, it does not provide a residual, so, uh, you know, the water can become, re uh, you know, uh, infected with microorganisms and whatnot. Deionization is another technology uh, uh, of using charged ions from the water uh, to clean it. It's 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 removes salts and minerals. 
it doesn't provide disinfection for microorganisms. It doesn't provide a residual. Uh, but, uh, you know, you sometimes run into this for certain applications. Ultraviolet light is another common uh, way to uh, disinfect water. Uh, it uses uh, a UV light to kill microorganisms. Uh, it does not remove salts and minerals. Uh, you know, the UV bulbs have a limited lifetime. You know, you should replace them every year. You know, I've seen plenty of people have UV systems, you know, and they're using the same bulb after three, four years, and it's just not effective after that length of time. Uh, you know, if there's suspended solids in the water, uh, say anything bigger than about 20 microns, then uh, that can actually shade and protect any uh, nasty organisms that are in your water. So you, you, you want to filter the water before you have the UV. Uh, uh, don't look at the UV light with your eyes, okay? That will destroy your eyes. And uh, it doesn't provide a residual. Uh, and uh, it does, it does, like I said, it doesn't re remove salts and minerals. But it's a popular uh, technique. Uh, it's fairly low energy, so it's easy to do with coupling with photovoltaics. Ozonation is another form. Uh, it creates ozone for disinfection, so it's a very strong disinfectant. Uh, it does not remove salts or minerals. It does not provide residual disinfection. And it requires quite a bit of energy. So it's not so popular for uh, solar applications, but certainly can do it. Uh, it's more for commercial scale. Chlorination, uh, this is typically how most uh, city water supplies use. Uh, because it's an effective disinfectant and it provides residual disinfection. So uh, the chlorine in the water will continue to kill microorganisms for maybe a week, 10 days. You know, it'll eventually evaporate out, but it has uh, some residual. Again, it doesn't remove salt and minerals uh, and you're gonna need some kind of chemical supply to do chlorination. So usually with like the big city water treatment systems, you know, they're going to use this as kind of a last step because it has that residual disinfection. So it's not going to let stuff grow in your pipes or whatnot. So uh, uh, mixed oxidants is another uh, way to do this. Uh, this. This is using electrodialysis of sodium chloride to produce oxidants, uh, ozone, chlorine, chlorine dioxide. Uh, so it, it's a strong disinfecting solution and it provides residual. So it's similar, you know, it's basically like the chlorine. Uh, it does not remove salts or minerals. Uh, you know, it requires some operator interface, uh, a little bit higher, uh, and, you know, some energy uh, and you need pure salt to run it. Uh, so this is less common, but we've used it uh, on some of our projects where we're just worried about uh, remote areas. It's hard to bring in chlorine and easier to ship in salt. So. Reverse osmosis. Uh, this is very popular. Uh, you know, here in El Paso, Texas, we have the world's largest, uh, basically, RO plant for inland water desalination of brackish groundwater. So it uses osmotic pressure to remove impurities, produces a high quality water, removes salts and minerals, removes microorganisms. Uh, it uses a lot of energy. We're often running at high pressures, uh, you know, to 400 PSI. Uh, you have to replace the me membranes that are used, the osmotic membranes. So uh, 
that's expensive and it provides no residual so uh, you know so a, a water system for a community they might combine this with chlorination as a final step but if you have a lot of salt in your water the saltier your water uh you know it the higher pressures are you're going to need so if it's less salty it's better than if say it's seawater okay and then distillation uh this is very popular particularly uh for communities with seawater desalination uh so this is a multi-stage flash in dubai for instance uh, it removes the salts and minerals, it removes the bacteria, it removes the parasites, it removes the heavy, heavy metals. Uh, so it produces very high quality water at a large product volume. The only real con is uh, it doesn't provide a residual. So again, if you wanted a residual, you would need to add that in. Uh, you know, if you, you know, take this kind of water and then uh, bottle it right away, it's fine if nothing can get into it. But, you know, for a community water supply, you might want to add chlorination to it as a final step for residual. So, so this chart kind of uh, sums up all these different technologies. Uh, the blue signif signifies complete reduction, the green significant reduction, and the white no reduction. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so uh, you can see the different pollutants here on the left, arsenic, fluoride, pesticides, and what technologies clean what? Reverse osmosis, distillation, uh, they pretty much can do it all. Uh, you know, in some cases with the little star, it means we're using a carbon filter at the end of the process just to be sure we get rid of any volatile organic compounds like benzene or gasoline or something like that. If you don't have those contaminants in your water, then you don't really need to do that. Deionization does a pretty good job. Uh, you know, you'll notice the only technology here with the residual is chlorination. Uh, so, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, just gives you an idea of, you know, boiling, chlorination, UV ozonation, mixed oxidants. These are going to basically uh, kill off bacteria, viruses in the water. Uh, but they're not gonna remove salts and minerals. Whereas RO distillation and deionization can remove a lot of those. So, uh, so that's the technology comparison. All right, I'd like to go into detail on distillation because this is one of the more practical applications where uh, you, know, you can do it at home basically. Uh, so, like the big multi-stage flash distillation plants that are used in the Middle East or on the coast, uh, you know, it, it does the same thing just at a smaller scale. So it's going to get rid of all your salts and minerals. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, so it's just evaporation and condensation. Uh, the distilled water is free of salts, minerals, heavy metals, bacteria, microorganisms. Uh, so uh, people use this for potable water. Uh, a lot of laboratories will actually use not necessarily solar distillation, but distillation for their water, uh, for their labs. Uh, you can use this for battery recharging. So we've had a number of labs also buy stills for their lab water. So it's fairly simple, it's inexpensive, uh, and uh, pretty easy to operate and maintain. You don't need electricity, you don't need pressurized water, 
you know, it's just a solar thermal device. So it, uh, it's mimicking kind of the way Mother Nature does it, you know, where water evaporates and it condenses in the form of clouds and then it returns to earth and rain. And through that evaporation process, you know, all the things you don't want in the water get left behind. So here's, here's kind of the same idea with the solar still. Here the condensers are glass or glazing. Uh, you know, we have some brine we want to clean, say here, uh, and it evaporates. It doesn't, uh, you know, reach boiling point, but say it's like 160 F or something. And then it condenses on the glass and then we collect in a little trough the distillate. So it's pretty simple, you know, it's very important that this box be insulated or your, a lot of your heat's gonna go out the box otherwise rather in than into the evaporation process. So this is the uh, energy uh, balance for solar stills. You know, if you want to determine, you know, how much energy and how efficient the stills are, these are the equations, uh, you know, for the how much energy is used to vaporize the water. Uh, and this is how you calculate the efficiency, basically, you know, the energy in versus how much, you know, uh, solar energy is, is actually able to utilize. Typically, like a single basin solar still is going to be about 60% efficient. You could also build multiple effect stills where you kind of repeat this process and you could get over 90%, but it's usually not worth all the additional cost and hassle uh, unless you have very limited space. So, so this is uh, all the different uh, heat transfer components for the uh, solar still you know, we have radiation, convection, evaporation, conduction, you know, everything's going on in the still. Uh, you know, a, a few things, you know, the first solar stills were built in the 1870s in La Serena, Chile, the fourth region of Chile by a Swedish engineer for the mining. So he had these big greenhouse kind of stills. Uh, uh, you know, what we've done over time, we got, you know, the greenhouse was on both sides. We cut off half of it and then we lowered the angle. So we reduced the convection losses inside the still. So you don't want a big high unit. You want, you know, typically maybe like a 10 degree slope on the glazing. So, uh, so here's uh, some stills. We started building with the El Paso Solar Energy Association back in the 90s. Uh, we have a problem on the border. We have a lot of fluoride in the water. We have arsenic in the water. Uh, so the solar still can get rid of these contaminants. Uh, you know, if you go like Northern Mexico, say Via Umada or some of these towns, you'll see people with like brown teeth, model teeth. Uh, because they have too much fluoride in the water. So that damages their bones and teeth. Or you may see, uh, you know, they have like white spots breaking out on their arms and stuff. That's arsenic coming out through their pores. So, you know, the arsenic kills you slowly. Uh, and so you want to get rid of these uh, nasty uh, contaminants in your water. So the still is a good way to do that. You can do it in your backyard whatever. So, uh, so here's a cross section of a kind of homemade still, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we want to keep the water level in here fairly thin, uh, maybe like three quarters of an inch to help evaporation. We don't want a huge pool, uh, you know, but we want enough in there that we don't have to constantly refill it all the time. And then, then it'll evaporate and we'll have our collection trough. So, and at the end of this, we'll 
we'll have some slides and a video on how to build your own. Uh, so this is, uh, well, this is from Solaqua. This is a company I helped found uh, where we do mass uh, manufacturing of solar still. So here we're using molds, you know, pour-in insulation. Uh, so, you know, it's a different scale than the homemade. But these are more the homemade. These are some of the early uh, El Paso Solar Energy Association stills. Uh, pretty simple to operate. You want to just face the still towards the equator, which is a south in, in the U.S. Uh, level the still. Uh, you add makeup water once a day. You should add two to four times uh, what your daily production is. So if you produce a gallon, then you should add two to four gallons. If you're using seawater, you want to go higher, like four gallons. If you're using brackish water, say, you know, a couple thousand parts per million, you could probably get away with uh, double your daily production. Uh, if, if you're not going to use your still, then we recommend you cover your glazing with some cardboard or an old blanket or something so that you avoid uh, stagnation temperatures with is the temperature the still will run if it runs dry so it might get up to like 240 fahrenheit 220 something like this uh, at stagnation temperatures and that that's going to cause your membrane to possibly outgas uh, you know, and you know, heat's just not good for long-term survival of components. So, you know, we don't recommend you run it at stagnation temperatures. Here's some testing we did at New Mexico State University. Uh, we tested uh, a couple dozen stills, uh, looking at what contaminants they removed. Uh, and generally, we had pretty good success. Uh, pretty much removed everything. Uh, we had one case where we found some pesticide carryover, so that's where we recommend carbon filters. Uh, uh, you know, it just kind of depends. But, uh, uh, so, but if you think you have pesticides, benzene, gasoline, these kind of volatile organic compounds, we always recommend you finish off the cycle with a carbon filter just to be safe. But you know, we tested raw sewage, no problem, uh, cleaned everything, uh, mercury, lead, you know, heavy metals, no problem. Uh, we, so we measured temperatures. Uh, so this graph here kind of shows you the temperature. This is in degrees C, uh, how many hours. So this is one day, two days. And uh, the ambient temperature versus the still air temperature. Here it is purple X versus the still water temperature, okay? So it just gives you an idea, you know, so we're getting up to, you know, 72, 74 degrees C in the middle of the day inside the still. So not only is it the bad stuff being killed, but it's also being pasteurized because of these temperatures. You know, really, you know, over 60 degrees C, uh, is pasteurization and you know you hold it for a certain amount of minutes and it's in there for hours and so it, it really kills everything that's in there as far as bacteria, uh, viruses, microorganisms. Also the UV rays coming from the sun also kill off these it's kind of like UV disinfection as well. So that so you know it's kind of a triple whammy because you're having high temperatures, you have the UV rays, and you're evaporating the water. So you get extremely clean, what we call ultra pure water out of a solar distiller. Um, here is a graph. Uh, the yellow is the solar insulation. Okay. Uh, and uh, and then the water temperature and ambient temperature. So basically, as you see the irradiance increase, we get the, the higher 
uh, temperatures here. And, uh, you know, it, it, like I said, it kills off everything over about 60 degrees C. Uh, so that just gives you an idea. And, uh, and the production rate. So here's temperature and water production. Uh, in degree C, milliliters per hour, so what you can expect. The rough rule of thumb is about uh, uh, one uh, liter of water per, well, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 liters of water per sun hour per square meter of still. So, you know, if you have say uh, five sun hours and you have a square meter still you can expect about four liters of daily water production here's a uh, production versus uh, again the insulation so uh, you can see how uh, the water production is kind of dash blue line lags the uh, the solar energy so what that means is, you know, even after the sun goes down, you're still producing. Because remember, your glass is your condenser, and it's cooler now that the sun's down, and but the water inside is still still warm. So you'll still get, you know, a couple three hours of water production, not a tremendous amount of water, but some uh, out of the solar still even after the sun goes down. Uh, this this gives you an idea of production. This is for Las Cruces, New Mexico. Over the year, kind of our uh, daily production, these are bajillion days, so 365 days in a year. Uh, how many liters per square meter? So you see in the winter time, we're producing about two, two and a half liters per square meter. In the summertime, we're getting up seven, even eight. Uh, liters per square meter. So here we got about four sun hours. Here we got about eight, and you know we got about six in you know March and October. So it gives you an idea of the production. Here's some more production data. This was from a three by six still. Uh, this was from April to October. Just gives you an idea. Uh, now this is gallons, so I was making two to three gallons a day typically, and and you know it was almost two square meters still. Here's a a, a three by eight foot still. This was production from uh, over the winter June through April, uh, and you can see you know here at the heart of winter we had you know we had snowstorm here big cold snap here so we didn't get much production on those days you know the, the still can actually ice up inside but it's not going to damage anything because it's open uh, it's not like a pipe where we, the water's enclosed so it just expands up and you can actually get some pretty cool ice designs on the uh, glass so uh, but this still you know is producing you know more like one gallon a day in the winter and then uh, three to four gallons a day in the hotter, warmer time of year. So, so this graph kind of summarizes all that. So this is the production liters per square meter, the insulation, kilowatt hours per square meter. So if you got six sun hours, you know, you could expect about five liters per square meter. Uh, for your still. So this is a way, you know, the ambient temperature does have some effect. It's going to lower your efficiency. So, you know, if you're a really cold climate, uh, you know, it won't quite follow this. This is desert southwest. Um, and then these are some results from uh, Sandia National Labs actually did some tests on the solar stills. So here's our feed water, distilled water, 13% salinity, 16% salinity. So basically, you know, 
uh, they found it removed pretty much everything, even the volatiles and organics. But again, uh, I wouldn't bank on this. You know, our distills are open to the atmosphere, so there's vents where nasty volatiles can uh, escape before the water evaporates. But uh, I wouldn't bank on that. So I would use, like I said, a carbon filter for those kind of contaminants. So, but you know, it's very effective. You know, less than one part per million typically for most of these kind of minerals. Uh, here's the total dissolved salts, 36,000 to less than one, 48,000 to less than one. So, you know, this is basically seawater. And we've had people use our stills for years to purify seawater successfully. So. so here's some more tests New Mexico State University did uh, using E. coli uh, seed, uh, you know, uh, and basically, uh, you know, you know, they would take something like, uh, you know, here, 2.9 billion organisms per liter, and then afterwards, you know, they measured 11, which which is basically just the noise from the measurement. So, you know, E. coli is a good indicator of what it kills off. So, very effective in killing off microorganisms. So. Here's some more results from New Mexico State. Some stills we had put in Columbus, New Mexico. Input, output, conductivity, micro Siemens, per Siemens. So this is indicator TDS. Uh, before and after, hardness, uh, fluorides, pH. Uh, so again, just effective in removing salts and minerals. We were particularly interested in fluoride since that was a big contaminant in Columbus. So we've seen that the solar stills are effective in measuring, in removing salts, minerals, bacteria, viruses, parasites, heavy metal. You know, it's good to purify seawater, uh, you know, raw sewage, you know. If, you know, I like after some of these hurricanes and disasters in Puerto Rico and other places, you know, uh, you know, if you have a solar still, you can use that to clean, you know, whatever water source you have available to you to, so that you can drink. Again, just the reminder that we, if you have VOCs, use a carbon filter. Uh, so, you know, there's many applications, uh, you know, for the stills, you know, from drinking water, potable water, uh, disaster preparation, battery water. Uh, you know, we did taste tests of solar stilled water and people liked it. Uh, it's not like when you boil water, it tastes very flat, and unappealing. Uh, you know, we have what we call bicarbonate buffering with the solar distillation. So the water actually tastes good. I mean, basically it tastes like rainwater. Here's an example of some stills. This isn't one of the ones in Columbus. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are more uh, low income communities that we have along the border. Here's uh, some other examples from New Mexico and Texas, uh, border colonias, installations. You know, we shrunk our stills over time because we found like the eight foot long stills unless you had a really big family, made more water. So people were starting to shade half of it to cut down their water production. So, so then we just cut down the size of the stills. Uh, and then also it makes it easier for shipping too. So if you need more water, then get two smaller stills. Uh, this was a project with the Environmental Protection Agency that we did some stills in Border Colonias uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, here you can see we've gone to a more manufactured still uh, to make it easier to build larger quantities. So, you know, this is the product water, you know, this is an overflow tube. 
this is a fill tube. So, you know, we, we set these tubes so that, you know, the water depth inside this still is maybe only about three quarters of an inch. Uh, here's some more stills in a, a orphanage in Ciudad Juarez, in the Sierra Taromara, in Loragachi, in Chihuahua State. Uh, we did some stills uh, for the Taromara Native Americans. This is a big project in Mexico. This was for community. It was actually for an ice maker. Uh, you know, so they wanted fresh water. Here we're basically purifying seawater. Uh, so this was producing maybe a couple thousand liters a day. It's another family, Hueco Tanks. Uh, you know, they even used our stills for an art project at the University of Texas El Paso Museum. So they took river water from the Rio Grande, which is right down here. That's uh, Mexico back there. This is University of Texas here. And then they would they put it in a tank. They took it down these stills and then they had it, the clean water dripped down to a art exhibition. So you never know where your still is gonna end up sometimes. So. So here's some idea about economics. This is the Valdez family in Ciudad Juarez in the Anapra Colonia. Uh, you know, they were spending about $175 a year to buy water from those tanker trucks you saw, which they thought was clean. Uh, so then they got a solar still and, uh, you know, they could clean uh, their water on site. Uh, some idea of cost, uh, you know, roughly about $400 a square meter. You know, the most expensive part here is the membrane because, uh, you know, you need something that's going to hold up to heat, it's going to hold up to UV, it's going to hold up to salts and minerals. So it's a very corrosive environment inside this still. And the water needs to taste good. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, you know, that's where a lot of our work's been of trying to work on these kind of materials. Uh, and the payback's about two years, you know, and, you know, you're still, you know, depending if you take care of it, what not, you know, can last you 10, 15, 20 years. So uh, she used this still for 20 years, I know. So. Uh, here's some cost comparisons versus four stage reverse osmosis, an electric distiller, solar distiller, and bottled water. Uh, so basically, you know, we come out pretty competitive. This is assuming 7% amortization over 10 years. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the, the electric distiller people really don't like us. They, they attack us on the web all the time, but, but that's because we're competition. So, but what do we call it? Fake news? No. <laughs> okay, taste. Like I said, we did some taste tests. So the taste is is very acceptable for solar distilled water. This is, uh, you know, some end user surveys we did after people had their stills for about a year uh you know basically 85 percent were quite satisfied 15 percent were uh and uh, that was because they didn't think it gave enough water they wanted more water so they really needed a second still uh does you still have a distinct taste many said yes now they generally consider this a favorable taste uh, and we did blind taste tests with, you know, bottled water, distilled water, tap water, you know, uh, and generally the solar distilled ranked the highest. Uh, you know, you can have some issues. Uh, you know, if you don't flush out your stills, you can get precipitate buildup, particularly if you're using seawater. So this is that same community system I showed you in Sonora, Mexico. Uh, where they're using seawater and they never flushed, they didn't flush out their stills. And so you, they started getting salt precipitates and then they started cutting into the liners. So, you know, it's important to stay on top and 
flush your stool daily. If you do that, you'll never have a problem. Uh, outgassing, you know, if you run into stagnation temperatures, what can happen is you can get some polymers depositing on the underside of your glass, your glazing, and this may uh, not allow the water to run down the glazing properly. Uh, so that'll reduce your production. Usually, you can you could just flip it over, and you know it'll weather off in a few weeks, and you know this side's clean. If you want to clean it quick, then you need a strong caustic like a Drano or something to clean it off and some elbow grease. I usually just flip it over is enough if you run into this. Different types of silicone glazing, uh, well, I'm saying silicone membranes have different outgassing rates, so it depends a little bit what you're using. So we talked about the advantages and the disadvantages. You know, we get very high quality water when we use solar. There's no moving parts. Uh, these things can last a very long time. It's pretty simple to operate and maintain. Uh, the life cycle cost, you know, much better than buying bottled water, for instance. Uh, and it can be automated. We have people, you know, they'll use like lawn sprinkler timers or something like that to recharge water into their spill. We talked about all, it pretty much removes everything. You know, the disadvantage is we don't have huge uh, amounts of water. So this is not water to flush your toilet, wash the car, or wash the dog. This is mostly for consumption. Uh, you need to flush pretty regularly, remove the precipitate so you don't get a uh, salt built up inside the spill. And if you want to remove VOCs, you need a carbon filter. So here's a, another family in Anapra uh, using, here they've paralleled two stills into one collection jar. So, And you can build your own. So if you're a DIY, uh, you know, there's different designs. This is using black silicone on the bottom and white silicone on the sides. The white gives you a little more reflectivity into the water. Uh, so uh, you know, maybe it gives you one or 2% more production. Usually we just make it all black, but if you want every, every percent efficiency you can get, you'd use white, use a low iron glass, uh, these kind of things. So here's, you know, you build a box frame. It can be out of wood, plastic, fiberglass, concrete siding. I mean, with you know, aluminum, or stainless steel, uh, you know, so there are many materials you can use. So here, this is a workshop we did in Sonora, teaching them how to build stills there at the Universidad de Sonora. Uh, you know, so he's, he's going to nail down some insulation into the box. So here they put the insulation. Usually we cut the insulation so that it's our collection trough. You know, that's preferable over, say, using like, you know, trying to cut half a pipe or something, which is always a pain. Uh, so you can just build your collection trough out of your insulation. Here they are, they're putting foil tape. This is where the distillate will collect, and they'll collect. Uh, so here's, uh, you know, basically the box using, uh, usually you could use like the foiled insulation. So the silicone will stick a little better to that. You want to clean it pretty well. Uh, and then they start applying silicone uh, and then spreading it. So usually we do about three layers. If, if it's your first one, you might need to do four. Uh, we use Dow 999A, which is a food grade silicone uh, rated by the FDA. So here they're spreading some more silicone. You know, you wanna do this outdoors or in a well ventilated area because the silicone can be rather overwhelming. So they put in the first coat, then we put a screen down, a nylon mesh screen. This helps give it rigidity. Uh, in case the membrane you're building delaminates from the insulation, it'll still, it won't bubble up or anything like this if it's got this screen in place. 
Here he's cutting corners on a screen. You know, the screen goes on after the first coat, but before the second coat. Uh, so here they're spreading more silicone. Uh, with the screen. Uh, and then here, here they're doing the third coat. Okay. So this kind of shows you this cutaway. You know, here's the base, the insulation, first coat screen, second coat, third coat, you know, maybe a fourth coat if you need it. So just kind of gives you an idea how you can build your own. And we have a video at the end of this where uh, one of my business partners, Mike Cormier, uh, will show you how to build your own. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, nearly finished. There's some finished stills for you. Uh, so you can build this at home rather easily. The hard part is getting the right silicone. Uh, so, uh, you know, you want to use a food grade silicone like 999A. You don't want to just use silicone out of the hardware store. We've had people do that and then they get sicker than a dog because you know basically they poison themselves. So it's got to be non-toxic. You know, the stuff in the hardware store is usually toxic. So don't use that. Uh, so uh, that it's kind of a quick overview. Uh, we could take a few questions and then we'll show the video. Uh, and, you know, I would encourage you to, you know, support ACES, join ACES, donate to ACES to help uh, spread the solar word. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. Um, no questions from the audience, but I have a question for you about how many like solar water distillation, like how many have you made, you think? Oh my God. Uh, it's a little hard to track because, you know, we get big orders, a few thousand. You know. uh, a few yeah. thousand, great. Yeah, yeah, but I've been doing this for a long time. Almost 30 <laughs> years. Yeah, so, so. Oh, here we go. We got some questions coming in. Um, can you repeat uh, the make and model of the food grade silicone that you recommend? Sure, it's uh, Dow Corning 999A. Okay, so you, you know, you go to a, you, you'll have to special order it. Uh, so, you know, okay. also, uh, you know, uh, you know, our solar company also sells the silicone or uh, so you can get it from our website to solacqua.com. Great. Um, are there any type of single ply membranes that can work instead of the food grade silicone caulking? Well, yeah, for the commercial stills, that's what we do. We don't spread silicone. Uh, we uh, we 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 you know have we make rolls of basically a silicone member and and you know uh, we can also we also sell that too for people if they don't want to spread silicone. Uh, okay, um, we've got a question: Can low minerals in drinking water be a negative thing? Uh, well, you know, I like to quote Dr. Andrew Weil on this, you know, so I, you know, I, having been in the solar distillation world for a number of years, you know, we've met many, I call them health fanatics who, you know, only drink distilled water. Uh, so, you know, if you try to get all your minerals from uh, your drinking water, you would die because you'd have to drink literally hundreds of gallons a day to get your daily requirements. So we get our minerals, vitamins from the foods we eat. If you're uncomfortable with it, then you know you can always throw in a multivitamin or something into your distilled water and put minerals, okay. trace minerals, whatever back in the water if you if you are concerned. Okay, great. And what about the wastewater or salt? What do you do with that? 
so if if I'm a good operator and I am uh, taking my water out every day, overflowing, you know, remember I said two to four times your daily production. So if I'm doing that every day, then the water that comes out is about the same as the water that comes in. So, uh, you know, you can, you know, depending how salty it is, you might, you could water the plants or you could put it back into the same water source you got it from. It's, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not going to change that much. But if you let it go months and months, then, you know, the salt content's going to build up. And then, you know, if you try to water your plants or something, it would kill your plants because it's too salty. <laughs> Okay. All right. Looks like that's all the questions that came in. Um, do you have any other final comments, Robert, before we play the DIY video? Uh, you know, just feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, you can contact me, rfoster at nmsu.edu or rfoster at aces.org, either one. Uh, so if, if you have some follow-up questions, I'm happy to support. You're, you're going to see a video now from Mike Cormier, who is our, you know, general manager, shop foreman, and, uh, you know, he'll give you some pointers about how to build your own. Okay, great. Um, for those of you that um, need to hop off, we are hitting the hour. Feel free. This video is about 20 minutes long that will play. Um, that's a DIY video that Robert put together and uh, ACES will be sending out the full recorded webinar for you all to watch again um, if you need to hop off or if not feel free to stay on um, don't forget to learn more about ACES at ACES.org and join today ACES.org slash join all right well if Robert you're good I can go ahead and start playing the video okay Thanks, Carly. Awesome, of course. Go. Hey, I'm Mike Cormier from Salagua, and today I'm going to run through the basics of a solar water distiller construction. Uh, typically, you can start with any kind of box or using plastic, but you can build a box out of two by four plywood sheet, plywood siding, whatever material. The important part here is the insulation. We're using a, a foil faced polyisocyanurate. The aluminum foil really adheres well with silicone. It's a big plus. Now, <laughs> uh, what you're going to be doing is building a membrane inside the box. You're actually going to be waterproofing the whole thing. The only thing the water will come in contact with is silicone or glass. Even the tubes here, I'm going to drill holes even here for your inlets and outlet. And then you have a water line out here, product line to collect your drinking water from the truck. So you're only touching silicone there. Uh, face it hand tools, just some plastic pieces, no big deal. Pair of scissors, your silicone tape measure, and the screen. Uh, the first step, we're gonna put down a layer of silicone, then embed the screen into the silicone. And then immediately, if you have time, put a second layer on top. We do the whole still like that, and then you do a third layer over everything you've done. You've built a waterproof still that will last for years. Cut. <laughs> so the box is all insulated. We've covered the insulation cuts with aluminum foil tape. Uh, we've primered the, uh, the insulation. Uh, they have silicone primers to make everything adhere better together. Uh, isopropyl alcohol will work, uh, but it's something you might want to look into. Okay, I pre-cut the screen. I'm going to set it in there. I'm just getting out of lengths, about level or even. Set down the back. We do this basic fold here. Do the two sides, or side and the back come together. Same thing over here. Screen. This is just a nylon screen, no big deal. And just a simple corners for now. And we'll cut that later. 
Now, in order to keep the screen in place, I'll place some weight back here. And then it's going to move on you. And cut. Cut. Yeah. So we're dry fitting the nylon screen. And what I like to do is maybe get it all back in the corners here, come right up to the front, and make the cut. You're going to cut off the corner right to this point. So everything will fold more easily for now. Now we'll fix up the rest later. Huh? I mean, you don't like having big cuts, but we're going to fix this with the piece we cut off. You see? I'm just going to make, make a little piece here. We'll silicone that and lay it in place, and then no seals. Now, the silicone we're going to use is Dow Pony 99A. And it's important that you use something similar, if not this one, because otherwise you're going to get sick. This is a non-toxic silicone. You're not going to find this at your regular home centers. You can find it online. But it, it's been used and tested for decades. Okay? This is good stuff. Paper towels. You want to have an adequate supply, you're doing with silicone. Paper towels. So, I'm ready to start putting down the silicone. I'm going to use a large lamp on this. The good thing about the silicone is when you're done for the day, you just leave a little bit sticking out, and it forms a plug, and you're ready to go. Right, we're going to be spreading a massive amount of silicone, so you're not going to cut the tip off. You're going to cut the piece right off in the pad. Uh, you have a couple ready to go. And don't pierce the interior seal until you're going to use the silicone. If you pierce it before and let the, the uh, tube dry out, you won't be able to get it out. Fat feeds of silicone. You can just go all the way around one time. Another two. Yeah. Here's the seal. We're going to do it pretty quickly. Press down pretty good, you want to make a nice seal there. Get it here to the insulation. Now to spread this evenly all the way around, not thick, just enough to cover everything. You don't need to use too much. I've never done a cake, so I don't know how to compare it, but it's got to be pretty similar, huh? Okay. If you get silicone on your hands, wipe it off immediately. It comes pretty, off pretty easily. Okay, now I'm going to embed the screen into the silicone. Try to avoid wrinkling here. Let 
trying to push the material into the other material. Yeah. Okay, for the second half of the still here, I'm going to just peel that screen back to it fresh and uh, start over. You need a helper or you can put down some either plywood or something to hold that down. And we're just going to repeat what we did in the first half. Not the silicone. a point where you're working and the silicone instead of spreading starts stretching and pulling on itself just walk away because the more you try to work it the messier it's going to get now this fresh stuff no big deal pretty easy but once you start into the your second application over the screen not working fast enough, you'll see the silicone actually drag. So just walk away. back down, spread it out, that's your corner, go into our corners, go to the back, so you don't see the screen anymore, basically. I'm just going to continue the same, same method. You do the back neck and you do the sides. To show you the corner here, you do this facing fold like so. So your two corners meet. Now, all you want to have happen here is 
didn't need enough material from each side to overlap. Way too much. It's not way too much for that actually. But when I do end up cutting it, I'll never end up down below the water line. All my cuts are above. That's a simple overlap in the end. It looks like it's going to come back. Nice little corner. And first I'm just going to cut off the top. It's a real rough cut. And I'm going to cut down towards the bottom. Just leaving enough material, plenty of material here to, so we can overlap both pieces. Huh? And pull more up. Okay, back here, I just cut, straight cut, to line that up, see the back wall comes over. And do the same thing here, in the side wall. Line the outside edges together. Simple cut. And you'll overlap your corner. You can cut down up top here. Cut a little more even down here. We've got plenty of material to overlap. I don't cut down below the water line. The water line is going to be three quarters of an inch in here. I just stay away from that and avoid any problems. So, okay, normally I would just let this dry, come back a couple hours tomorrow, and start doing the sides because you have to lay this down. So I've got a helper here today. You can hold that in place. Let's do right there. Now, if you have a, you're worried about your corners here, here's a good time when you're going to take care of that worry. You can bury a bunch of silicone down here in the corner. Okay, it's dying. You're going to piece up that bottom edge there, and then you'll have no troubles. So I'm going to start out with just three lines across. In this case, we're going to bring the silicone all the way down the bottom to over the top. Like so. So again, pushing it in. You can always drag more over. If you need more silicone, you know where to find it. Okay, so everything's covered. Now again, just bring it up, don't pull on it. And try to stretch it up. Just let it go in place. Leave that bottom secure, huh? Make that nice corner. Okay. That other side of the way for now. You know, the stuff has a tendency to when you pull on the screen, is to pull it up from the bottom. And you really want to avoid that if you can. Looking pretty good. 
Haven't done one of these in 20 years. <laughs> Okay, second coat. Put in the top. Okay, it's very good. Take a break. Okay, awesome. Great video. Any comments, Robert? Uh, well, that just gives you the basic steps, you know, he'll do the other sides and then uh, just one little hint when you put the glass on the top after everything's dried out, uh, you, you set the glass on top of the box and then you put a bead around the edges. Do not put a bead under the glass. So that way, if you ever need to remove it in the future, you just go with a little razor box cutter or something and it'll easily remove so if you put the silicone under the glass it's harder much harder to remove the glazing later so just beat around the sides great no okay great so um i put some links in the chat asus.org is our website if you want to head there to learn more about our organization. And again, like I said, I'll be sharing this information with you um, in the coming days. So you can watch this again if you'd like. And feel free to reach out to Robert if you have any additional questions. Rfoster at aces.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Robert, um, for presenting with us. Muchas gracias a todos. <laughs> All righty. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.